so are we going to take another crack at talking about this whip thing? Crack. I see what you did there. And yes, let's do take another crack at it. I, I was mean earlier. I need to explain myself. First of all, I need to apologize. Okay. Secondly, I need to explain engineer mode for you. Tell me about engineer mode. So there's this thing that happens. Like if you get a bunch of engineers in the same room, they don't care about people anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that came through. That came through. <laughs> they, they don't care about people. They just care about getting to the data. That's all that matters. And anything like a relationship or like people that care about them, anything like that is just in the way. So I owe you an apology. It's all good. Because when we listened to that version, <laughs> well, oh, we, dear. we've had this conversation and it was it was very clear that I was angry. I was not angry at you. I was angry at not completely understanding a multi-phase flow event that may or may not have been happening in, in two different altitudes and parts of the country with two different mechanisms. And I was asking you questions and I was not being kind and I owe you an apology. You're a really good friend and it's cool, buddy. And I think, I think part of the reason I really like being your friend is because your brain isn't just like mine, but we can irritate each other at times. And it's weird that recording a segment of the podcast, I wouldn't call it a crisis, but it definitely prompted a legitimate friend level conversation <laughs> coming I, that was that was some pretty honest stuff we said to each other there to, offline to, it was like it was like the last five minutes of a sitcom level stuff you know the the first the first 25 minutes or whatever is all like oh man the protagonist is in a strange situation in the last five minutes are like but what really matters <laughs> yeah and then at the end there's like a leaping high five where it freeze frames on the high five and then there's a pop song and everything's fine again, just like it's always been. So can we just, do you want to just do the leaping high five and talk about what we learned? I'm not quite ready for the leaping high five because I want to explain to you humanities guy mode. Okay. I, Go ahead. I'm better understanding engineer mode. Okay. But the thing about engineer mode is that your discipline is one that involves empiricism. You yes. use your five senses to look at tangible data mm -hmm. and you're, you're doing a real thing. It's all ones and zeros. Everything's ones and zeros. And it's just a whole giant collection. But you, you know, you, you feel it and you want to get to the business. The thing about it is in humanities mode, I'm doing the same thing. We're ones and zeros also. They're just abstractions. And the only way you can actually look at the stuff you're studying is words. And it just takes more words. I don't think it's the same thing. It's very different, Matt. Tell me how it's very different. Well, for example, the person who taught me differential equations, mm -hmm. his name was Natakorn Sukantamala. Do you think he spoke excellent English? I mean, I don't want to let my biases come through, so I'm going to say perfect English. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> the person that taught my wife physics was a person named Dong Mi. Hmm. Do you think that person spoke excellent English? Uh, I'm going to say Omaha, Nebraska, newscaster, perfect. Yes. So my point is, the thing about hard science and engineering and math is it transcends language. Yeah. You can draw it, and you can have a conversation about Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms, and you can have a conversation about compressible fluid dynamics without having to even know the language. That can happen. And so that's what I was trying to do with the whip thing. And it wasn't working because we don't speak the same language. Well, first of all, should we just talk about what we're talking about? Because it's this is probably lost on people. They probably think we're just like doing a hug thing. Yeah, well, we are doing a hug thing. And yes, I would be just fine with that. So, so basically, I did a video on YouTube about how a bullwhip breaks the sound barrier. Which was fantastic. Thanks. Appreciate that. And it was a, a very complex phenomenon that was trying to explain how it works. We're not explain, explore how it works, really. And we assembled a team and we captured all this data. And then I came to you and I said, hey, dude, what's up with fly fishing? Because if I understand the phenomena the way I think I do, I would expect for you to see shockwaves over your head while you're fly fishing under certain setups, right? And my response was that 
while a noble effort based on one fly fishing outing uh, in 2017, your your read on the physics of the fly line was flawed. You were incorrect on a lot of what you were assuming. Correct. I thought I understood a lot more about what would happen than I did, and I, I didn't. And so that was frustrating to me. But it's true that you do see shockwaves when you fly fish, correct? That is correct. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because when I watched that video, and, and I watched, I mean, we communicated daily throughout the process of you making that video. I got constant updates. And you know that my opinion before that video happened was, this is one of the coolest things you've done in forever. This is a meaningful contribution to science. Like, I've been very excited about it. And you delivered. It's awesome. That said, I didn't even think about the fact that while you had a whip master in that video, like I'm no master, but I essentially manipulate a whip every single day of the summer while fishing. And I, it didn't even occur to me to think about the physics of that based on what you were studying until you pointed it out. So thank you for connecting the dots. And well, when we started to compare notes, what we slowly and frustratingly painstakingly discovered it was, was that <laughs> there is some overlap, but the physical design of a fly rod is so different from the physical design of the whip because they're meant for very different applications that there's stuff to learn from both, but they're, they're very different devices. Yeah. I still have this thing in my, here, can I grab this real quick? One second. Sure. Okay. So I've got this thing right now in my hand. This is a, it's a wooden stick. It's, it's not balsa wood. It's something pretty, it's like pine maybe. And I've got a string, just a normal, it looks like a cotton string. It's about three foot long. And check this out. If I whip the, the, the switch, I, I'll call it, it's what we used to get whipped with in the South. If I whip oh. the switch real quick, listen to the string. Sounded like nothing. Oops. Oh, that one. Oh, that one sounded better. Do it again. <laughs> that was me hitting something. Hold on, wait. Here we go. Let me try again. Did you hear that? That was good. The first one was humiliating. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Let me see if I can do it near the mic. Hold on. Let me stand. Okay. Standing right. up. Standing up. Ow. Here we go. Ooh, crisp. Okay. Yeah. So basically, what's happening, as we've learned with the high speed, is as the string is unrolling and turning around, there's this moment where the tip of it goes past the speed of sound and a shock wave is generated. But it's not and, at the moment of full extension, correct? Correct. That's what, you know, I always thought because of Castlevania, right? Right. I'm going to have to put this down because it's really fun. No, okay. I'm not sure you're going to. <laughs> yeah, the Castlevania whip, though, is essentially three frames. The backwards curl the halfway extended, the arm all the way out with the wrist forward and fully extended. So the Castlevania whip is effectively a sword in the 8-bit version. Yes. It's just a sword with a goofy wind-up. Exactly. And the thing that's interesting to me is when you crack, I'm, I'm using the wrong terminology, as you project forward the fly fishing rod, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a lot more similar to a German whip design, which is called like a kerbachi. I don't really know how yeah, to say from it. The, the guy in the moose clown suit. Exactly. Yeah. That the, whips nature into cooperating. Exactly. The Germans, they have this thing that they do every February where they'll, they'll whip the, the, the German black forest whip crackers. They have these gigantic whips and they, you know, move them back and forth really fast. And I don't know why, but they line them up and they kind of do it like a domino effect. I'll, I don't know. You need to check it out. We'll leave a link in the description or something like that. But and they, it's to make winter go away? Exactly. They whip they whip the air to make winter go away every February. I, that's really all I know. Seems legit. And you said something about somebody having a, a river whipped? Oh, yeah. Well, did you ever see 300? Yeah. Yeah, so Xerxes, the giant eight-foot-tall Brazilian... The, the god-man? Yeah. God-man king thing with all the nipple piercings. When he was marching to punish the Athenians... He had to cross, you know, that narrow little chunk of water between Turkey and and East Eastern Europe. You can picture that, the Hellespont, yeah. the little river there. So when he went across, he tried to build a pontoon bridge that he could move this whole gigantic army. And I mean, I think it's Herodotus estimates that army was like a million, which is an exaggeration, but it was a lot. Holy and cow! So he wanted to get him across on pontoons, right? Yeah. Well. I mean, you're an engineer. You can see the problems with this. Like, it's, that'd be hard to do now. Yeah. And uh, 
it was uh, it was a nightmare, and the wind kicked up, and his big expensive bridge broke, and so he got the uh, he got the floggers to come out, and they waded out into the Hellespont, and they famously flogged it repeatedly to assert the will of the God King, and well, eventually he did get his troops across the water, and then they got beat badly and humiliated by the Spartans and Athenians. Should have whipped them, I guess. Dude, there's a um, speaking of building bridges. There's a book I have in here of the Civil War, and it's engineering during the Civil War. And part of the part of the cat and mouse game was blowing up the other side's railroad bridges. Have you ever read into this? No, I haven't. So these jokers, no joke, somebody would come along and blow up a railroad bridge. They would deploy a team of engineers, both sides did this, to my knowledge, and they would go out with axes and they would build a bridge strong enough to carry the load of an entire loaded down locomotive with train cars, they would build it in like two days from just trees around the area. Oh, you mean to recover destroyed bridges? Well, not recover. They would make one from scratch. Well, sure. That, that's what I mean to say. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. To recover the ability to pass that, that point exactly. of water. Exactly. Two they, days yeah, with it's, trees? It's ridiculous, man. There's pictures of these things in this book. It's unbelievable. I'm like, how the heck did they do that? It's it's insane. Have I told you about the tie hacks from out here? No, what's that? It relates to what you're talking about. You're talking about the engineering marvel, just the brain power to make that happen. And I'm yeah. in awe of that. I wouldn't even know where to start. I lost all the bridge building competitions in you know middle school and Olympics of the mind and stuff. But But also, just how are you going to make wood to spec so that you can have any ability to predict what kind of strain this or that support can handle. And out here, there were a group of legendary axemen called tie hacks. What? And the, these guys, have you ever ridden one of those uh, like like uh, log rides at an amusement park? Yeah. Where you sit in like a log and you splash down and everybody get your flume. picture taken. Yeah, that thing. That is based on the tie hacks of like Western Wyoming and the West in general. All those railroad ties that built like the Union Pacific and all of that came from this forest near here where I live. And they turned the whole gigantic mountainside into a vertical logging camp complete with log flumes that would zigzag down the mountain into an entirely flooded valley below. They dam it and then just <laughs> dump these, these railroad ties down the log flume and it would just fill all of this artificial lake at the bottom of the valley. And then they would, as soon as they could walk across it, like it was flat ground, they'd blow the dam and ride all of the logs clear down the wind river all the way until it became the Bighorn river and like all the way to Casper or wherever they rode it to, to then distribute it out to the railroad. But the ties were not machined. The ties were cut on the mountainside by tie hacks who wielded these like giant, Norse two-sided Viking axes. Oh, was it an ad, ads? A D Z E AIDS? I don't know how to say it. A D Z E. But it's basically I don't know what how a hand hewn beam is 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 made, correct? It, 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 it's this sounds similar. I've never heard that word before. I'm 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 learning here. But these guys, I've seen a video of it, and I don't know if it's on YouTube. They could take a raw timber down to a railroad tie to spec. And those need to be right, mind you, in 60 seconds. Unbelievable. That's, they would hit nuts. it on the downstroke and on the upstroke the whole time manipulating the piece of wood with one hand from time to time. I, I mean, it, it looks like a human shouldn't be able to do it. And so I wonder if in the South, I wonder if these Confederate engineers had some kind of like team of essentially tie hacks who could just eyeball and use a hand ax to get things built to spec so that the engineers could know or have confidence in what they were building with. I don't think it was just the Confederates. I think it was also the union, but it's almost like looking at the pictures in the book and admittedly I need to read. It inspired me to buy a book. I bought a book called engineered victory about the civil war. Um, yeah, I haven't read it yet, but I have bought it, but I don't know. It's almost like special operations engineers is what this was. It's like, hey, huh. our logistics line is whipped. Go over there and fix it, engineers. And so these jokers would go out there 
where there was a battle a couple days before, or, you know, Sherman came through and chopped up everything. And, you know, Sherman famously destroyed the railroad and tied the rails in knots. Are you familiar with that? <laughs> no, I know. I know Sherman made a mess of the railroads, but I haven't heard that. Yeah, that you'd set the cross ties on fire and then just tie the rails. Huh. Anyway, that's what I was always told. I don't know if it's true or not. I need to, you know, citation needed. But That's like salt in the fields. Yeah, it's messed up, isn't it? Okay, where are we at? Whips. Do we need to come back to whips? Yeah, I think we're real close to coming back to whips. So to, to round this out, you're saying two days to engineer a functional bridge like this. Yeah, can I just grab the book? Let me grab the book. Is that cool? Yes. I mean, to me, that defies reason. Let me go get the book. Okay. Okay, I have the book. It's called The Embattled Confederacy, The Image of War, 1861 to 1865, Volume 3, National Historical Society. So let me find this. I just remember reading this and being like, what the dump? There's no freaking way this happened. (laughs) All right, bunch of dead people. That sounds like the Civil War. You're getting close. Bunch of cannons. Okay, here we go. Seeing some bridges. Okay, I'm doing that thing you did when you were a kid, when you just hold the book and you just flip and you look at the pictures as it goes. Uh Uh-huh. Not because they create some kind of cohesive image, but because that's how you know where things are in the book. Yeah. That's why I keep all my college textbooks instead of buying new editions. Same. Because I'm a visual kind of guy and I remember. Oh, God. Oh, it was on like the upper left. There was a picture of whoever that general was. So it's on the upper left. If I just thumb through, I'll find it. Speaking of whips, one of these pages, oh my gosh, this is a picture of a slave. J.W. Mercer, assistant surgeon of the 47th Massachusetts, examined 400 runaway slaves in Baton Rouge in the summer of 1863. Oh my gosh. The whip could be brutal in the hands of cruel men. This slave, Gordon, later became a corporal in the Union Army. Okay, so this individual, Gordon, was whipped and... Boy, I didn't expect this to make the connection. Boy, that was weird. So the whip in this case was used as a lash, right? And so the idea was to inflict or like land the whip broadside against the skin and create these large whelps and break the skin and things like that. But the whip that we were using for a completely different purpose, which is to create sonic shock waves, right? That's when someone was working a team of mules or something along that line. They could create a shockwave to one side of the animal or the other and scare them in different directions. So there's a lot to whips. They're used in different ways, and it's it's one of the more cruel things that's been used in in history. Well, and a flog physically is doing a very different thing. I mean, because there it's not as much about creating the supersonic event— to hit somebody with a, you know, a shockwave or a rapid lash there, it's far more about getting extra momentum on those multiple lashes so that they flip forward hard enough to dig into flesh. And then the person who operates the flog doesn't pull the whip back for a snap. They pull the whip down through the flesh. So the whip gesture digs, the pull pulls it across the body to chew people up and turn them into hamburger. So let me ask you this, Pastor. Oh, boy. <laughs> Anytime you start like that, dude, whether the microphones are on or not, when you start like that, I'm nervous. Um, John 2.15. You read that? Uh, yeah, I have to look it up. I know I'm theoretically... I'm you mean so- you don't have the Bible memorized? No. <laughs> it was in the other book. It was in the other book. Okay, John 2. What are we, uh, what are we looking John, at? John 2.15? John 2.15. Read that. Um, okay. All right. Uh, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins and the money changers and overturned their tables. Jesus made yeah. a whip. <laughs> yeah. Do you think this was a whip used as a lash or a whip used for shockwaves? What do you think? I don't think you usually make a whip that's a lash for people who aren't fettered. What does fettered mean? People uh, in chains or cuffs. Like normally, if if you're whipping somebody with a flog, they don't have the option to respond. 
I don't think that would be an effective move strategically for Jesus or anyone in that situation. I would guess this is more about the supersonic event and making racket and shooing people. I would also guess that theologically because Jesus, well, we have no record of him doing violence to anyone, like like hurting people. And when people tried to hurt people in his name, I, he shot that crap down in a hurry. Okay, I found the I found the section. I'm sorry, I was thinking about bridges while you were telling me about Jesus whipping people. Okay, take me back to the bridge in a second. <laughs> what do you think of my explanation? I don't know. I think Jesus made a whip, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. I'm, nice shot. I mean, it's like Simon Belmont. I mean, the intent is to certainly intimidate and strike fear into people. So what's the equivalent today? Mace? No, because Mace hurts people. Oh, you're, There's you're, no indication that Jesus hurt anybody. You're going to sit here and tell me that a whip, like he built a whip and didn't hurt people with it? Yeah. You just said that a, a whip can be effective as something that creates noise to move animals. It can. I don't know. I'm just I'm just trying to see what the deal is here. I, I mean, I've, I've just thought yeah. about that. Do you think, because some versions say lash, like he made a lash. Let me see this, studylight.org. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I could poke around at the Greek and try to figure that out another time. Okay, here's a dude. I'm back to the railroad thing now. You with me? Yeah, I'm cool with closing the account on Jesus whipping stuff. Cool. Keeping the US, but we're not done with whips. We're not done with whips. Keeping the U.S. military railroads running would be a massive task for the innovate, innovative Haupt, H-A-U-P-T. So this person, he was in charge of it. He proved equal to it. Here he paddles a small pontoon boat of his own design used for inspecting bridge foundations. So this dude, Haupt, how do you say that? H-A-U-P-T. Haupt? Are you talking about a, a formal name? Yeah, it's his last name. Okay. So his deal was he had a team of engineers. He was on the union side. And there's a picture right here of him with all of his engineers in Chattanooga. They've got axes and they've got plans and, and prints and stuff. And then they've got like sticks and stuff coming in. Golly, that's it's really cool. Anyway, we need to investigate this another time. It looks like I may have been wrong about saying they could do it in two days. I need to go check that out and figure out how long I it was. I want to know now. Yeah, I yeah. do too. Golly. Yeah, because you hear about those moments in history. Those... No, 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 no. Here we go. Here we go. Two days before, this creek was an impassable barrier for trains. Now a train can cross safely. Okay. They called them beanpole bridges. Okay, here we go. Here in 1863, one bridge is tested. Halp's beanpole bridges made him famous, attracting the admiration of President Lincoln. The bridge over the Potomac Creek was built in 40 hours, utilizing two old piers from its destroyed predecessor. That's brilliant, dude. That is amazing. Wow. Look up Civil War beanpole bridge. Uh, right now? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. All right. Civil War beanpole bridge. Okay, that Haupt guy, are you sure that's a last name? No, I'm not. Is it capitalized? Because I, that's yeah, like a it it's is. like a term for an overseer. It's like a it means like like the guy in charge. Yes, that that it seems to be his name. Okay, so it's not a title. Interesting. No. It's, okay, it's, Potomac Creek Bridge. I don't know anything about this. I'm seeing this for the first time. So look uh, at that. These are the pictures of this thing. Yeah, go to the bottom on images. Look at that that particular oh, bridge. Oh my goodness. That's a yeah. I see the two old. Uh, what do they call that? Uh, the supports, pilings. What do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The what? old. Oh no, it's right here in this book. I'm looking at the same picture in this book. What's the term? I, I have never built a bridge successfully. Was built yet. in 48, util, utilizing two old piers from the destroyed predecessor. Piers. Dude, I'm looking at this thing. That was built in 40 hours. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it is. It's like sometimes my my little head stubble. We'll get a little long <laughs> and I'm like, ah, I got to trim that down so it doesn't, you know, look like I'm a skeezy balding guy. And it'll take me sometimes like three days to remember. So that's 72 hours to remember to run those clippers over my head in the shower. These guys built that uh, railroad bridge in 40. Isn't that crazy? So it, they're better than me. Beanpole bridge. I don't even understand how this could happen. I cannot imagine what it would have been like to be the guy who drove over the top of it the first time. <laughs> so you're sure? Cause there's, look at that picture. There's these, people on top of that like bridge. This looks like a high school project. 
There's people on top of that bridge. Let me pull that one up. Yes, there is. That's amazing. Prince That's Rupert's amazing. Literally... People are incredible. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that wild? Wait, no, what's your stupid cat doing? Prince Rupert is, is obviously in the loudest box he could be in this room. Let me, let me go move him. Hold on. <laughs> what he's, no, no, no. Just, okay, all right. Duper. Reminds me of when we had Emily on. <laughs> Except her cats are nice, I've decided. Why are you doing Sybil. Sybil and the... Uh, eat it. And the other one. Sybil eat it. and eat it. Oh. Yeah, Prince Rupert's right. gone. Okay, I'm back. I won't miss him. So this bridge is, is unbelievable. This shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's ridiculous. And they did it time and time again. They did it at Bull Run. Uh, let's see. They did it later. There would be time to elaborate and refine the bridge once it was passing traffic again. The makeshift undergirdings of the previous photo is replaced by the sturdy shad belly. So the deal is they would do whatever they could to get the bridge passable. And then mm -hmm. they would come back and they would engineer it after the... <laughs> After they mm -hmm. could support mm -hmm. a freaking locomotive. Unbelievable, man. I know that insane. I wonder if they uh, pulled all the proper permits. Yeah. Okay, here, the same wonders were worked out west. The first Michigan engineers, with some infantry help, built the Elk River Bridge near Estill Springs, Tennessee. That's out west. <laughs> That's adorable. Yeah, I know it is, isn't it? It was 700 feet long and 58 feet high. Anyway, there's this whole section... In this book, another one in Chattanooga. Yeah. Anyway, and for this people is... who don't know, that terrain in and around Chattanooga, even West Tennessee, it's not the Midwest. It is not a little adorable green prairie with some trees mixed in. That is some crazy terrain all around the Tennessee River, but especially by Chattanooga. Yeah. Like, I bet that bridge was incredible. Yeah, it's fascinating. Anyway, sorry for the uh, the rabbit trail there. Mm -mm. But, no, I'm um, not, and I'm not quite done with it. Have you been across the the bridge that goes over the Hoover Dam now? Uh, yes, the I new have. One? The, when you're standing on the Hoover Dam facing out, you can see the bridge, correct? The one that's now, yeah, the way up high, insane yes. bridge? Yes. Oh, my goodness. That's incredible. It, it is. I want to go across that bridge on a double-decker bus someday because they built the the concrete barriers so high to keep cars on it. And I think also so that you won't be tempted to look and get weirded out and panic and behave badly. But so you can't you see stop. over. Yeah, you yeah. won't stop and look at the, the Hoover Dam. Yeah. Exactly. Which is responsible, and I get it. But they couldn't stop me if I was in a double-decker London-style bus. So That's I just a want really to good one idea. Of those and zip across there real quick. Maybe we should buy one because oh. because clearly we have. <laughs> what if we created a business venture to get double decker bus buses and and do tours? I think it's a real good idea. I think it would work. I want to paint a winged hussar right on the side. No one will know what it means or care. They'll just be confused, and it's fine. <laughs> okay, buddy, yep. change of pace because I want to talk about HelloFresh, and I'm excited about this because. They are great partners. They've been kind enough to sponsor this podcast. They've been with us for a long time. And I continue to just love what they do. But give me the official version of what HelloFresh is. They send food to your house. You get to pick the meals and they give you step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients. So you just cook, eat, and enjoy. It like simplifies the food game at the house and lets you eat a meal with your family. That's awesome. Here's something I super like about it. When I realized that life isn't quite working on a personal level the way I want it to, there's usually a couple things I want to change, right? It's like diet and exercise, but I don't know what to do with that. I don't have time to think about the diet part. And so it was really nice to have HelloFresh as just kind of a life partner because they're good at food. Does Camilla know that HelloFresh is now your life partner? Is she aware of this? <laughs> is that too strong a word? <laughs> it's kind of too strong I kind of a liked word. It. I, well, I'm sticking with it. It happened and it stays. <laughs> Tina, that stays. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, the big deal with HelloFresh is you get these cards with like six steps and you just do the six steps and then you have like a wonderful meal and you feel like a chef without the hat. I think the number of crinkles in your hat. I want the hat. I heard that that has something to do with how good of a chef you are. You would have like a thousand crinkles. If Wait, do you get more crinkles like, if you're good? Yeah, I think like if HelloFresh gave out hats, you'd have like a thousand crinkles. Oh, what if you really, got a crinkle for every HelloFresh recipe you made? That'd be rad. Or like some kind of pen. You know what you should be able to get is like a pennant. 
And then you can collect yeah. all the little pins for each one that you've done. It'd be like that. Uh, like flair on office yes, space? That'd be I rad. want that. I want flair. <laughs> There's three different types of meals. There's classic veggie and family. And you can pick whatever you want. I mean, like you go online, you pick the meals and they're great. I've eaten every bite of every HelloFresh that's ever come to my house. It's wonderful. I've never been disappointed. And they're they're branching out and doing some really creative stuff that I think all of these are new, but they're doing this dinner to lunch thing. It was like a meal that you make. And then you're, you're guaranteed to you know, get leftovers with it. They, they portion it out the right way. There's the 20 minute meals for the people who are zipping home over lunch, but don't want to eat out and still want to try to stick to eating good food at home. Fancy gourmet stuff, the one pot wonders. So there's a lot of creative stuff. If you checked out HelloFresh in the past and haven't looked for a while, they're really doing some neat stuff. You should go back and give it another look now. If you want 80 bucks off your first month, 80 bucks off. Go to HelloFresh.com slash NDQ80 and enter the promo code NDQ80 at checkout. This stuff is delicious. Again, HelloFresh.com slash NDQ80, promo code NDQ80. If you haven't tried this, you're going to love it. And if you have, you know we're telling the truth. So thanks to HelloFresh for being a part of this. Anyway, what we learned with our whip stuff and fancy business is that the crack of the whip happens before full extension. Yeah. And my question to you, Mr. Fly Fisherman, was do you ever hear a shock wave when you're fly fishing? Yeah, and we and he, boy, we had trouble nailing this down. And yeah. uh and I'm gonna do better right here. So I've thought about this. Almost no one listening has ever fly fished. You have fly fished once. So here is the incredibly concise description of what happens when you go fly fishing. Normal fishing, you got a thumb trigger on a little rod and you got a heavy lure on the end and the weight of that lure, you know, it's like you're throwing a baseball with the rod. It throws that lure way out into the water and then you reel it back in, right? Super straightforward. With you, with you. A fly rod is different. If you're right-handed, you would hold a much longer rod. It's like nine feet long in your right hand. And what you have is a little reel clear down at the bottom that has a goofy a goofy kind of line attached to it. It's like it's this thick. under your hand. The reel is under your hand. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, yeah. And this, this fly line is like this gummy rubber cord and it's like bright green or yellow or goofy colors like that. And it's tapered so that the part that attaches down by the reel or into the reel is the skinny end. And the heavy thick end is the business end clear out at the end of the line toward the fish. Does that make sense? It does. Well, except for, no, because at the very, very end, it's not heavy and thick like that because the fish would see it, right? Mr. I'm going to sneak up on fish. Correct. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, yeah. and It's like tapered on both ends. It is. So the gummy, rubbery fly line is heavy on the business end, but then on the end of that gummy fly line, you attach more like typical fishing line, a real, a real thin monofilament kind of thing that tapers all the way down to almost nothing. And that's what you tie onto the fly. So can you picture the whole rig now? Yeah, I got it. So you've got a a thin monofilament, you call it backing, backer, whatever? Yeah, backing is the stuff that is is like dental floss and it actually connects to the reel. You almost never see that when you're fishing. It's it's way, way down there. So so that's in the reel. And then you've got this gummy, almost like a really thin... Something you would use for like a, a catheter, like if you were going to run uh, sure. like a, a line into someone's vein, sometimes doctors will do that. They'll actually run a line down into your heart. It's called a center yeah. line. Mm-hmm. So something like that is what your fishing line looks like, only the fishing line doesn't have a hole in it, right? Yeah, and, and you and you and that's correct. It's solid throughout. And you don't catch the fish with the fly line. You catch the fish on the end of what's called your leader. And that's the clear, tiny, little, almost invisible tapered line. And that's about another nine feet long. Well, what's the difference in the, the end of a nine foot rod or seven? What's foot. the difference in the tippet and the leader? So a leader is one single unit that you attach to the end of your rubbery fly line and that you attach the other end out to the actual lure, the fly itself. A tippet is like if you go through several lures and your your leader's getting a little bit short, but you don't want to take it all off and put on a new leader. You might tie on uh, some tippet, more monofilament, just attach that to the leader to extend the life of your leader. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's all secondhand when you've done it a bunch of times, but it's a very foreign thing for people who've, who've never done this before. And so then what happens is 
the way you get your fly, your lure into position with fly fishing is way different. You create a whipping action that isn't really very dramatic. It's a, it's a very, frankly, muted gesture where you kind of raise your rod and that causes that weighted gummy fly line to get a little bit of, of momentum behind it and to flick back behind you in the air. So that line extends straight back behind you and it'll straighten out all the way. And then you gently bring your rod back forward and it changes the momentum of that unfurled line behind you and brings it forward, transfers the energy down the rubbery fly line and into that leader, which then slows the energy so that that fly gracefully drops down into the water and tricks the fish into thinking that a bug has just gently landed and then they hit it. If you do well, what's called flogging the water, which is just whipping your line back and forth, the fish know better because that's not how bugs land on the water. But but the action is different than a whip. So the, the way a, a whip works is you have a thick handle and it tapers mm-hmm. down to a smaller diameter and it, it tapers all the way down to a very thin popper at the very end. And so because of the conservation of momentum, as you extend your hand forward, the mass of the handle, so you have momentum is mass times velocity. So okay. you extend your hand forward and you're moving the mass of the handle forward. And then that has to transfer to the next section of whip, which is smaller. And because of conservation of momentum, in order for the mass times velocity to be equal because mass is smaller, velocity has to go up. And then that transfers to the next section in the whip and so on and so forth. And you get down to the very, very end where it's a very tiny, tiny string at the end. And because of that, you you get this sonic event because it actually goes beyond the speed of sound because mass times velocity of the handle has to be equal to mass times velocity of the string at the end. And there are wait, orders wait a minute, of- Wait a minute, I'm trying to wrap my brain around that. I was with you on everything right till there. Yeah. Mass times velocity at the handle must yes. end up being equal to mass times velocity at the end? Yeah. Yeah. So that mass and velocity is then effectively, it's just, it's just tightened. Yeah. Same energy, just focused. Yeah. There's going to be some aerodynamic losses and there's also going to be some elastic losses, but for the most part, that's what conservation of momentum is. Like if you have a billiard ball and you roll it and you hit another billiard ball, even if they're both moving after the event, then momentum is conserved. There's another fancy thing in there that has to do with how strongly they bounce off of each other. It's called the coefficient of restitution. But I've assuming that that's, phrase. yeah, long story short, the momentum of the handle when it's extended has to be equal to the momentum at the end of the whip. If nothing else is moving. If you only have one thing moving at the beginning and one thing moving at the end and conservation of momentum is a thing, then that has to be true. So M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2. Okay, so mass times velocity, and the one is the handle and the two is the end of the whip. Right. Cool. Okay, I I can visualize that. So my question for you is, does adding additional mechanisms maintain that relationship between mass and velocity, or does does it change it? So, So what I'm saying is, Is there one formula from the grip of the fly rod to the tip of the fly rod and then a separate formula or a separate conservation of momentum from the the line closest to the end of the rod versus the line all the way out at the end where the fly is? Or is it all one mechanism? I don't know. I, I can tell you this. In the fly rod, aerodynamic forces and drag forces dominate. And in the whip, they they don't. And so that's the main difference. But with the German kibachi whip, or kibachi, I feel so bad that I don't know how to say that. Um, I'm going to grab this real quick. I got the stick again. If you listen to this sound, you can hear the stick. Yes. You hear that? Mm-hmm. And so if I if I play out the line here, which is in a knot now because Prince Rupert's a dummy. Stupid. Oh. So you can hear the swish and the pop. Yeah. So you're losing energy with the swish. That's just happening. 
And the same is true with a whip, but it doesn't dominate the equation. And I think in fly fishing, part of the whole deal is the fly is supposed to have high drag so that it doesn't fall down to the ground. That's part of the deal until you want it to. Hmm. And when when you do it, you want it to happen gently. Yeah. With a whip, you just want to cut through the air as quickly as possible. Yeah, and that's the difference. They serve two completely different functions. One is to provoke an animal, and the other is to lull an animal to sleep into thinking that it's safe to eat. The thing where I'm not sure it computes for me is that I understand that aerodynamics has a a tremendous factor in in how the fly fly rod situation works, because I cast a lot, and I, I feel that. But also, the weight of that gummy fly line where it connects to the leader, the last few feet... That's pretty heavy. And it unless there's meaningful wind, you really are in, in total control of that cast all the way through the back cast and coming forward. I feel the transfer of energy up the rod, down the line. And I feel like you're beating around the bush. The reason I brought this question to you is because it was clear to me that a, a sonic event could happen with a fly line. Sure. And does that happen? No, almost never. There's only one circumstance in which it will happen regularly. If you have a fly, a fuzzy fly on the end of your leader, I think that disrupts the ability of the end of that leader to snap and create a supersonic event like you would get in a whip. The drag is just too great. It's meant to slow down and not snap. But if I do my back cast and I snag something and you sometimes don't even notice when you just tick something on your back cast, a little twig or a rock. Sometimes you'll, you'll do that and you didn't know you lost your fly. It's back there on a tree and you come forward with your forward cast and you feel like you're still fishing and you put the line way out there and you can't really see your fly. You're like, oh, I'll just reset that. And so you do another back cast. Then when there's no fly on there, pop, you'll hear it. And you're like, oh, oh, I don't have a fly. That was a supersonic event. And you just reel in and you put another fly on. That is when I notice it. I don't ever notice it on the, the forward cast as you're, you're dropping it in for the fish. I bet you could make one. So on the back cast, meaning when you're pulling the line back, so does the shockwave happen behind your head or in front of your head? Way behind your head. Okay, so when you've played the line all the way back and you're whipping it forward. Mm-hmm. So it's right happening at that moment as you start to go forward is when you would get the pop if there's no fly on it. So Dr. Kroll, K-R-E-U-H-L in Germany, he wrote the authority, authoritative paper on whip physics it's from an experimentalist point of view. And he noted in his paper that as the German whip crackers in the Black Forest would, would whip that stick forward like that. Mm-hmm. As they would whip it forward, the line would play out in front of them. And then they would retract the stick like that before it was at full extension. And by doing that, they created a velocity difference between the string and the stick. And that would make that loop of the string unfurl quicker. If you whip somebody with a towel in a locker room, isn't that how you do it? Exactly, yeah. I mean, you pull back on it, right, to get that extra little pop? Exactly. Yeah, I think it's intuitive. And so what is happening right there is you are you are creating more velocity in that MV equation, right? That's kind of yeah. what's going on yes. there. It, and so I think when you whip that fly line behind your head, and, and what you're doing, or at least what you taught me, is you're whipping that, that rod back, and then when the line's at full extension, then you pull it forward gently you wait and you catch and you feel that tug on your hand from the fly and then you push forward if you were to whip back and then whip forward before it's fully extended back i bet you would hear it more often i don't think so okay and the reason i don't think so and i could be wrong we should just we should just turn a camera on and test this the reason for that is because the way the energy transfer happens behind you that back cast has got to be pretty good because it's so much line in such a small area it's really hard with the flex of the rod to get that snap unless the line is all the way unfurled. Otherwise, what you get when you pull forward prematurely is just a big glob of line coming forward. It's maybe counterintuitive, but it does not straighten out and snap. In fact, 
I really can't imagine a scenario where what you just described would happen with a fly rod, but I can imagine a scenario where that would happen with a more rigid stick attached to maybe a shorter, more controllable line. Interesting. Maybe that's why a fly rod, or one of the many, many reasons why a fly rod is springy, is to control that deceleration of the string as it's back behind your head and then cushion the blow so that you don't get any weirdness like that happening. Hmm. But bottom line is you can get a crack behind your head at the point where you're turning around and you hear it when mm-hmm. there's nothing on your line. So yes. what that means in engineering terms is when the drag coefficient of the end of your line is low and you're able to cut through the air because your cross-sectional area is lower, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. excuse me, yeah, 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 drag coefficient and cross-sectional area are lower. So the drag force on your line is way down. Uh, it's, it's The equation is one-half coefficient of drag cross-sectional area times velocity squared. That's the equation. And, so and my intuitive those, read would be it's way down to the point of nothing. Like there's just no resistance back there. It feels way different. You also have body drag on the line itself, which is a weird thing I don't understand, and I don't know how to compute it. So hmm. I'm probably about to have to learn that with this paper we're working on. Anyway, so all that stuff's working for you, which is why I would think you would hear the crack with nothing on your line because what we saw in the slow motion footage of the whip is right before the pop happens, the cracker would collapse into nothing but a string and that's when it would rapidly accelerate. And so yeah, th- the way I would articulate it is the drag coefficient is going down, then it rapidly accelerates, passes the sound barrier and then expands. Except what you have here is it, there's nothing to expand. Correct. Anyway, yeah, it's it's already as condensed as it can be or as wide as it can be. Can I, I mean, uh, you got to indulge uh, engineer guy for a while. Can I in- indulge humanities guy for just a second? Sure. I sort of think about these things while I'm fishing. I, I, you definitely think about your cast and your form and learning how to cast in different ways is part of the trick because you don't always have all the room for a back cast. So for example, sometimes you'll hold a rod kind of, you know, out from your hip and almost make a little rolling circle with your hand and it creates like a, a shockwave loop that'll send a line out without much of a back cast. It's called a roll cast. It's a totally different animal. And so I, I definitely, I use all the wrong terms and I don't have the formulas, but I'm thinking about all the stuff we're talking about while I'm fishing and trying to figure out how to work whatever area I'm in or how to trick a fish and present the fly the right way. But mostly it's just, it's just this beautiful rhythm when you really get into it and you're, you're dropping a fly into a little bit of just gently moving water and you put it a little bit upstream and then you just maneuver the line and the rod to let that, let it just bounce along riffle to riffle downstream for a nice long float. Then you collect a little bit of line with your left hand and reset that and hit that spot again. And there's just, there's this peaceful rhythm that comes out of this enormously complex collection of physics that you're talking about. I think it's really remarkable how something so complicated through muscle memory and familiarity can become so soothing and peaceful and simple when you put the whole thing together. And that is my humanities guy spiel. And I will stop now. Hmm. And I'm fine with hmm as your response. I realize we've fully engaged engineer brain. <laughs> I think we just, yeah. Engineer brains here. And, uh, Yeah, I enjoyed fly fishing with you. It was beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. You felt the beauty of it. Oh, yeah, obviously. And and that wasn't the first time I'd been fly fishing. I've I've been fly fishing. There's a place here in Alabama where they stock a stream with trout. Oh, cool. uh, Yeah, it's below a dam. It's really cold. Um, And I've caught a few on power bait, so not without a fly. So you would say I haven't been fly fishing. I've been power bait fishing. I would say that doesn't totally count as power bait fishing. (laughs) A little different. But still, yeah, no, I'm not looking down on you. No disrespect. It was with yeah, an thank- engineer buddy, if that, if that makes you feel any different. You mm-hmm. know what I like about stuff like this is what? in the truest sense, this is the 50-50. This is where it's fun to put our brains together. Because I'm thinking, I'm engaging with this stuff, but I don't, I don't put terms to it like this. And it's really fun to have you come into my world and unlock some of the stuff that I really care about with the way you see the world. So thanks for talking fishing. Dude, there's a level here that there's only a few people I can engage with on the the terms and the things that I'm thinking about there with that line. 
And I, I just need to think about this more. All right. Yeah. Well, when you need somebody to come and cast in front of a camera, let me know. I'll have fun with that. Yeah, dude. I want to schlear in the fly. I would like to be your schlearinizer. Yeah. I mean, but there's a normal cast that nobody cares about, right, in in terms of aerodynamics. Like you, you the fly fisher, you don't want it to go supersonic. You don't care. You, you don't care if it even how fast it goes. In fact, the whole point is to make it not move and just drop in the water. Yeah, slow and controlled. All the magic for me happens on the back cast because there's things happening back there that you don't want to happen. The good fly fisherman is more in control of that back cast than you would figure. Yes, I'm with you. That's actually probably one of the more important things when you're fishing, right? So you don't want to hit really all that is. junk behind it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there's another thing happening here, and that is people understand supersonic objects moving in a straight line. They don't really understand them moving in a curved path. Hmm. And they also don't understand, or at least I haven't found anything, where people think about fuzzy things moving at supersonic velocities. And that's what I'm very interested in here. In my brain, I put it all together, and I was like, I bet Matt knows a thing or two about this happening back over his head. And you do experience shock waves when you've lost your fly. I do. And that tells me that the thing that matters here is the drag coefficient on the fly. And when that's gone, you do go supersonic. Yeah, it's going to be fun to learn more about it. We totally need to make a Wing Hissar shirt. Yes, it's weird that we haven't. Can we do that? I kind of want to make a third chair shirt, too. I mean, is it okay if we do both? Yeah. Like, I don't know how you depict a third chair. What about a Wing Hissar and a third chair? <laughs> what no, it? you're mixing the metaphors now. We can't do that. We can't do did that. You okay. see, did you see the thread uh, on NDQ where people were debating what people who listen to this program should be called? I did see that. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Um. The Matt's mom suggestion was there and people rightly pointed out, well, that doesn't include Destin and it's true. And so that, that, you know, I I really like my mom and I'm really grateful to her for all she's done for this podcast. And I'm still looking forward to when someone who isn't her starts to listen, but I agree. It it doesn't quite work. I think the two front runners were Hussars for anybody who listens, winged Hussars who absolutely go above and beyond to the level of ridiculous to actually sponsor the program. Those were the front runners. And then also just the third chair was the other one. W- what's your preference? Wing to SARS. Is it? I don't like the SARS. Right. Yes, it Golly, is definitely. It's, it's definitely. And like, what I want is like a, a mountain with a horse on top with a hussar up there with the wings spread out and like this ray of light coming out from behind his head. So you want Gandalf getting ready to charge down to Helm's that's, Deep. That's exactly what I want. Are. Except I want a big, yeah. long lance that they use, like the big, because yeah. they were heavy infantry, right? Yeah, they were just enormous lances. The only question I have is, does it need to have words or not? Uh, it's we're, They're going to have to be words. You think? Um, I have arrived. 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 Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And then the winged okay. hussars arrived. Or just the winged hussars arrived. Or no, I have arrived. Is that what you said? I have arrived or <laughs> arrived. One or the I other. have arrived. I like I have arrived, dude. I have arrived. The thing about arrived. that shirt is anybody could wear that shirt. Yeah. Like you could you could be like, man, that, that podcast is milky crap. I hate it. But that shirt, give me eight. Like th- <laughs> that's just going to be all the shirts I wear now. Like church, yeah. funerals, weddings, everything. But give you've never, you're never to the point where you're like, I don't know, in life, I never feel like I have arrived, you know? Like you never uh, arrived. Would That's you, sp- if you were on top of a mountain in that armor, ready to ride down and save Europe a second later? See, I would feel like I'm at least in the process of arriving because I'm never <laughs> going to do that. I'm never going to do that. There was this uh, older couple at Subway the other day. Yeah. And uh, nobody knows this. I don't know how people aren't catching on, but the right door is always locked for wind purposes and the left door is open and they came over to it and they were heading right for the door that's always locked and they start tugging on it and they're older and they're confused and he's got a walker and wearing those like glasses that wrap around your whole head. And I was like, I know what I have to do. Like Horace And I Grant. left my sandwich, which was, which was <laughs> yes, like Horace Grant. Good <laughs> reference. <laughs> yeah. And I leapt from my chair and I ran over and I, I opened the other door that they hadn't figured out they could try to pull on yet. Dedication. And they looked at me Dedication. confusedly and walked in and I was yeah. like, I have arrived. Like I, that's, that's like me saving Europe from the Ottomans. Pretty much. 
pretty much it's as good as I got, dude. I really <laughs> like I really like that shirt. That shirt needs to happen. It needs to happen. Are you, but what about the stratified naming? Like I'm seeing that here in the subreddit. I mean, hussars and winged hussars. Is that too mean to stratify? Or is yeah. it okay to give a position of special honor to those who are like, I'm kicking in on this stupid thing? Mm. Oh, golly. See what I mean? There's like, different things hussar, we could do. You're awesome. But that dude's like a winged hussar. So. But I want the third chair shirt, too. What, what would that even look like? The third chair shirt. I, I just the third chair as a concept says so much more about what the program's about than the winged hussar. I mean, the winged hussar is awesome, but I... What is that? Like, it's so different from what any of us are. Whereas like the third chair, like, hey, yeah, that, like that, that's like, I'm pulling up a chair to be a part of a conversation that's beyond me. I'm going to think outside of myself a little bit here. And like, I, I really like it. It's, it's quaint and it's nice and it's inviting. I'm a listener kind of thing. Like I'm the kind of, kind of person that listens. Yeah. So how are we going to do this? Do what? Pick a name? No, no, no. How, how are we going to do the, the shirts? Oh, it's really simple. Uh, we talk to our friend who's good at making shirts, Bethany, and then we make a shirt and then we tell people, Hey, there's a shirt and it's awesome. Buy eight. <laughs> and then they, then they buy them and they have them and then other people see them and they're like, what the heck is that? And they're like, it's a shirt from a podcast. And they're like, I listen to that podcast now. I have one request. Can they just be rad colors? Just like rad colors. Like things that like when you walk, you're like, Whoa, that's Whoa. That's a loud shirt. Yeah, let's do it. And it says, I have arrived. I've arrived. I don't know, man. Arrived. That's pretty. Mm. Arrived or I have arrived? One word, dude. It's just like, stuff it. I'm here. No, what if it's just like, what's up? I'm here. <laughs> well, that's pretty good, too. Like, like oh, the most man. understated, like, you know, I'm, I'm literally here to save all of. No, not what's up. Western. Sup. With, sup. An, with an apostrophe at the beginning just, of the word just sup yeah that's gold man what up ottomans <laughs> that's pretty good sup ottomans Ooh, ooh, that's strong sup vienna did you know that spotify gave me my end of the year playlist uh listing the songs that i it thinks i care about most how did you like did they email it to you oh it just it just happens it, it was just on there it appeared and so i i clicked on it what do you mean it just appeared like on spotify yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't know they did that, but then it was just there, and it was like playlist 2018, top 20 or whatever. What? Yeah, that, and uh, I can tell you, I think Wing to Sars was number one. In fact, I'm, I'm virtually positive. <laughs> this this is kind of important. We're not done with the shirt talk yet, but uh, I think it's just only right and fair for you to know exactly where it ranked, and for you to also know where Havana by Camila Cabello ranked what do you say it cabela cabello i don't know but i like that song dude and i'm not apologizing were you waiting for an apology are you serious waiting seriously do you know the song yeah i do i do it's, uh, it's then you whatever know it's awesome that's all right it's whatever. whatever yeah it is whatever holy cow man i saw it i saw it live and i didn't understand what was happening you saw it live where was this at the the youtube thing don't get me lying seriously she was there yeah Oh yeah. my goodness, the video's great, the song is great. It's I mean it's just spectacular. Oh, uh, man, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that yeah, live. I, okay, so how do I find out <laughs> Dude, how do, how do I find my my most played made I don't know. for you? I wonder if maybe it goes away. I I'm scrolling through it right now and I'm not seeing it. Uh I'm you, really Oh, here we go. This. Your top songs. Here we go. Are you ready? Yeah. Where'd you find that? Uh, I went to, let me get this right. I went to Made For You and went to the very bottom at even, what? Made For You. Okay. What? Uh, even Okay. More. Your top songs. Okay. Uh, let me guess your number one. Okay. Well, first of all, it looks Wings like. Hussars by Sabaton. No, it's not. Oh. It's uh, that song by Dodie, The Middle. No, I like that song too. No, it's, mm. uh, my family has been. Give oh. me one more guess. One more guess. Uh, no, it this... is. Flowbots, handlebars. Uh, that was in the top five, but no. Okay. It's Smooth Operator. What? By I don't, Shaw Day? Yeah, and I've never heard that song. He's a smooth operator. It's, I mean, it's unbelievably boring. It's one of the worst songs of the 80s. It's miserable. Are you that, kidding me? Th that doesn't make any sense. You could have given me one billion guesses, and I never would have guessed that. Well, I, I don't know why. 
Like, no, that doesn't make any sense. That that could only happen by something getting like stuck on repeat or something. Because I never listened to that song this year. Number There's two something makes wrong with you. Number two makes total sense. Uh-huh. It's "On the Water" by Steve Martin. Oh, I know you like that song a lot, and you should. It's a good song. Number three. It's just ru- so funny that your top song is "Smooth Operator," <laughs> and you made fun of me for Havana. <laughs> You've got a lot of growing up to do, Mister. Whatever, dude. I don't. Mm-hmm. Th- I, I I have no idea how that got in there. Um, oh yeah, me neither. That's what I say about everything when people catch me with stuff. <laughs> I don't. I, that's my cousins. Okay, uh, "Rocket" by Andrew Peterson. Yeah. Okay. People, yeah. I, yeah. I like that. People have made fun of. Me. And then "Handlebars" by Flowbots. That's a good five. Yeah, pretty good. All right, I, I'm giving you ten, whether you like it or not. Okay. Uh, "Wing to Zars" is actually number three. I was sure it was number one. Dang. It's number three. Uh, number it's a, one. F- it's in my lot. It's in my top ten. Okay. All right. Well, that that seems legit. I mean, people okay. know we're not lying. Then number yeah. one, "Fire" by Barnes Courtney. Have you heard it? No. It's awesome. Okay. It's just spectacular. I found it on a Netflix series, and it's just like, oh, it's sweet. It's like that dirty blues rock, Black Keys kind of feel. Awesome. Yeah. Number two, Ooh La La by Goldfrap. Do you know anything by Goldfrap? No, I don't. It's cool. For people who play uh, Borderlands, all of Goldfrap stuff sounds like the Mad Moxie theme. If people have no idea what I'm talking about, it's probably for the best. Uh, <laughs> Wing to Sars is number three. How You Like Me Now by The Heavy was number four this year. I wouldn't have guessed that, but... No, yeah, that's a pretty good thing to put on your wing to star just, shirt. Just scroll down a little bit and then tell me the one that you're a little embarrassed to have on there. Because oh, I'm know- sorry, there won't be one. I'm proud of every single thing. I- oh, oh wait, no, there's one. Okay, I'm gonna get you there in just a minute. Uh, number five, I know exactly why it's on the list. It's because of Thor Ragnarok, it's an immigrant song by Led Zeppelin. Okay, you know the one. Uh, I think I do. I'm not a hundred percent. That one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Ah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Uh, okay, uh, then The Dark Side by Muse. Then I'm going to skip the one that I feel a little shame about. What is then, it? You have to, uh, no, that's not I'll how the game right works. That's <laughs> no, not how the game works. It's inconsequential at this point. I think we can agree we're all pretty masculine men. I think men we're and, alone now. No, and I wouldn't be ashamed of that either. I like that song. It's still yeah. awesome. That Tiffany's my first crush. Well, one of them. Uh, no, it's uh, What a Feeling by <laughs> Irene Cara from the original uh, motion picture, I think, of Flashdance. Mm. You know the okay. song? I don't. What a feeling. Da, 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 da. Something, something. It's powerful. She's the same lady who did the theme from Fame. Okay. You remember that one? I'll take your word yeah. on it. Okay. Well, I'm ashamed. Uh, Figure It Out by Royal Blood. Crazy Little Thing Called Love by Queen. That's good. Pinball Wizard by The Who and The Passenger <gasps> by Susie and the Banshees. I played the Pinball Wizard pinball game. Oh, I bet you did. At the Asheville Pinball Museum. That's a story for another time. Anyway, keep going. Okay. Uh, it turns out that Havana comes in at like clear down at like 15 or something. So I exaggerated my appreciation for that. Uh, Flirting with Disaster by Molly Hatchett, 17. Uh, 19, Pride and Joy, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, Debbie Gibson's Lost in Your Eyes at 20. <laughs> what? <laughs> Didn't you think Debbie Gibson? What? She had, the, what she had her, her blue jeans. I can still remember oh, the hole in her no. blue jeans on the on the front of the cover. Oh, no. Uh, hey, Dustin, I need to talk to you about something. Yeah, what's up? I'm really sorry for what I said about your playlist. Uh, the second worst song of the 80s, Lost in Your Eyes by Debbie Gibson, is is on my playlist. And um, I shouldn't have said the things I said. I didn't think about what would happen if that rebounded on me, and it did. And I'm embarrassed. And I'm sorry. What's funny about mine is that every once in a while, the South will jump out. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's who you are. I forgot about that. Like what? What, what? what tips your hand there? The Coon Hunting Monkey, Jerry Clower, <laughs> Live so 1972. Wonderful. You sent me that. I'm, not, I'm surprised it's not on mine. When we I was listened to that a when lot. When I grew up, I was born. Oh, golly, that's so good. Oh, yeah. Man. That's really all you need to know. There's some other uh, stuff on here, but that's all you need to know. Yeah, it tells me what I need to know. I got some rap on here. Yeah, the last thing that matters on this list is uh, Fortunate Son. By Credence. Oh, yeah, it's good. Do you know that Credence isn't from the South? From California. They're from California, and they were like, you know what sounds cool? Alabama rock. I bet we could do that as well as those boys. Southern rock. And what stinks is they were kind of right. They're good. They're dang good. They're good. Yeah. What did you say was on yours? You have some rap in there? Yeah, I got some rap in there. Um, You have that Hopspin song on there? Yep, Hopson's in there. Uh, Hopson. I always say it wrong. I'm I'm a big dope. There's one Eminem song in there. 
Uh, there's, yeah, there, there's another guy. You, you know this Heat Rock, this uh, this new guy, Toby. Oh shoot, he, he's out of Houston. He's a rapper in Keith? Houston. No, he's just now starting. Mm-hmm. Toby Nwigwe. No, I have no idea. N w i g w e. Why should I listen? He's good. He's uh, he's just starting from nothing. He calls his wife fat. And her handle on Instagram is Toby calls me fat. Huh? Yeah. They're, they're, well, he's starting from nothing, and it sounds like he's going to end up at nothing. No, they're a good couple. They're cool. There's a lot of respect oh, okay. there. Yeah, oh, it's oh, okay. It's good. Yeah, they're they're good folks. So I follow them both on Instagram. Cool What's your last thing. song on your top whatever it is thirty list? Give me uh, the very last song. Larry, last song is. Particle Man by They Might Be Giants. Yes. That's great. <laughs> I feel good They're about wonderful. that. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. You should. And Last you? song on my list is LaGrange by ZZ Top. Oh, yeah, you yeah, You know yeah, that yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one. Mm-hmm. That's so good. So shirts, well, we're doing fun. them? We learned things about each other. That was real fun. <laughs> shirts, yeah, we're doing them. Thanks for, uh, thanks for indulging the, the Spotify Side mentioned shirts. Yes, have we? Are we saying we have not agreed yet on what we're going to call? I mean, we should let the listeners pick what the listeners want to be called. It'll show up in the subreddit. People are okay. smart. We'll just we'll all right. Listen. We'll let them handle their business and then we'll cooperate. Is that fair? Yeah. R slash uh, no dumb questions and R slash NDQ. We'll we'll be watching.